Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles and the year 2021. My name is Rich Mayfield, uh, member 1211. I used to be your program's chairman, but now I'm not. <laughs> but I'm still doing the first couple interviews just for old time's sake to welcome in the new year. Today we have Greg Downing, member 1221. That's right. Palindrome. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Palindrome and, you know, it goes with the year. Yeah. You're one of our newest members, right? I am, yeah. So, um, we're here to talk tonight about a trip that you took to Egypt, correct? Yes, that's With right. With a documentary. Yep. And what was your role on this on this expedition to Egypt? Sure. Well, I was working kind of a, a hybrid of digital documentation for cultural heritage, uh, and but primarily some visual effects for the film needed some photogrammetry, which is a technique I specialize in. So, what is what? Can you define photogrammetry for us? Yeah. So the uh, the simple way of saying it is that you take photos from a bunch of different angles. You, from the parallax between the, the different photos, you can recover all the 3D information about the scene. So you get a 3D model from the scene, and then you reproject that imagery back onto the model as a texture. So mm -hmm. then you have something that is three-dimensional, so you can move around it like a 3D model, but it looks real like a photograph. So the, the simple, an even simpler way to say that would be that you're getting 3D from photographs. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of technology. I guess, I guess people could, you know, measure and yep. create a 3D model. That's right. But you're saying this is all from pictures taken at different angles. That's right. And, and they can use the, the slight differences in perspective and all that kind of stuff yep. to actually recreate like What's the in front of the camera. That's right. That's so right. Then, so then you can walk around it later in a computer? Yeah, so when I created this, that was not a, a real possibility. W w what did you create? Uh, so What is this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, yeah, so there's a documentary film that's being made. Okay. And there's a bunch of captures that I did for creating 3D models that um, aids in the creation of the illustrations that they want to express. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I also did captures for myself, kind of anticipating what would happen with the technology. And this was in 2008. Okay. Uh, so it, anticipating what I could do with the technology. And uh, then I was able to create a virtual reality piece many years later. This is only like four or five years ago that I made the VR piece based on the photography that, that I shot in 2008. So in 2008, you, you knew that one day computers would be able to recreate a 3D model from the pictures. So you took the pictures in such a way that you could actually yeah, we just create. about, just about. So at the time, we're just on the cusp of being able to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I had to write a hack that hacked a public piece of software called Photosynth that would let me do that. But what I didn't know was the availability of VR headsets. I didn't know ah, that okay. what that piece was going to happen. And as soon as that happened, then you can walk around inside of it. So photogrammetry was there, but yes. it just rendered it in the computer. Yes, yes. Photogrammetry was there if you wanted to work really hard to get it. <laughs> now it's a little easier, but then it was so really hard. So what photosynth was it like at the university level where like some professors or PhDs released it and they're like, ah, yeah, knock yeah, yourselves yeah. out. So I, I, I had worked in photogrammetry and film and other areas in motion picture. And uh, I might take like maybe 10 photos and those 10 photos would take me months to get anything out of it. Hmm. Of, of hand labor, marking every point, et cetera. Eventually what happened is that became automatic hmm. and almost instant. So instead of months, it takes seconds. And uh, the first piece of software that did that was something Microsoft released to the public, but it wasn't made for creating measurements or creating models. It was made for collecting photos and looking at photo collections. So uh, I, I wrote a piece of software it's called a sniffer that would kind of see what it was uploading and intercept the data and grab it and then allow me to create media that could make it through. This is really technical and long. I, I, I'm into it. I'm, I'm sorry. for the. It's a little technical and long. But basically, we would it, it'd be able to intercept the data and then use it for other purposes like visual effects, uh, creating 3D models, and other uh, interesting things okay, that you wait, can do. So, so the, let me understand this. The Microsoft program did all this, the capabilities, but they didn't give you that 3D model. Yeah. So you intercepted 
you know, you yes. you, you sniffed or yep. whatever the term is. Yep. You intercepted the data that they were sending to their servers. Yes. Or that was coming down from their servers. And you're like, oh, this is 3D data. And then you parsed that. Yes. And you used it for yourself. Exactly. And is I'm that not... within the terms of service for the Microsoft product? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they'd have um, it covered in, the, in that five pages that you signed I, off on. I told them what I was doing. Um, they, I didn't get that. I got a... They were they were not te get telling me how to do what I was doing, right? Um, but they thought it was cool that I was doing like interesting environmental and archaeological projects by manipulating their tool into ways they hadn't really considered. Interesting. Yeah. So let's get back to the Egypt expedition. So you yes. you signed up t for this expedition as the digital uh, capture archivist. Yeah. Uh, what 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 was there? They were doing a documentary. What was the yeah, so um, it was originally done by French Channel 3, and uh, French Channel 3 uh, funded the project, um, and uh, forgive me for not saying the French version of the name, but is for a series of shows called Roots and Wings. Okay. Uh, and uh, so they made uh, this show as part of Roots and Wings, and it was later uh, uh licensed to National Geographic, so it went on National Geographic Channel, and there it was called Lost Treasures of the Nile, or Sunken Treasures of the Nile. Okay. Um, let's see if I Roots get the title. Roots and Wings to Sunken Treasures, so they took some liberties with the translation, huh? It, it was part of the Roots and Wings series, but it was something like Lost Secrets of the Pharaoh Builders is okay. the best I could do for translating it. My French is horrible, I apologize. Um, but... Um, Anyway, so uh, Nat Geo brought it over, translated it, and made an American version and broadcast on U.S. television. Cool. And I, I was originally brought into this by a cultural heritage documentation uh, nonprofit uh, that's called Insight Digital, and that's run by Kevin Kane, who coincidentally is kind of how I ended up in this seat right now, because uh, his partner was uh, Megan O'Neill, who did a presentation here on Teotihuacan. Okay. And I had dinner with them one night, and she was telling me about the Adventures Club. She's like, you live in L.A., you don't know about this? And I was like, I've got to check this out. This sounds incredible. And she gave a presentation here. Um, found, your, found your way to the right spot. That's right. And, and I was just having dinner with Kevin because I had done this project uh, with him, and you know, we've worked on many projects over the years related to technology and cultural heritage. Mm-hmm. So um, out of this, when you were, you were in e Egypt, you got some stuff for yourself. You got some yes. pictures for yourself. And what did, what did you end up creating in yes. the VR world? So um, what I did was I, I, among the things that we were shooting and is one of the subjects of the documentary, uh, was this very small, intimate uh, tomb that is... Uh, uh, so Philippe Mart Martinez was the... Uh, 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 archaeologist, Egyptologist on the on the project, and um, what he's told me lots of wonderful things about this tomb. It was like just burned in my mind all the things that he told me about this this tomb. I was so impressed, and uh, what he described it as it's the tomb of middle management. Uh, so okay. <laughs> uh, the whole documentary is basically an exploration to try to figure out how they move these massive thousand ton obelisks and colossus statues and even just blocks to build temples, how they moved them from the quarries uh, that were just above Aswan and, and Gabal Sicilla, and how they get those onto boats and then ship them to where they were installed in Egypt. Yeah, flying saucers. <laughs> right, right. You'll, right. you'll see that. But uh, the age-old question, right? Of, yeah. Of, of, uh, how, 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 they how they do that. Right. How'd they do that? Uh, so this was... Uh, an exploration of how they did that using modern tools that we have that allow us to do things. Sorry about that. Good time for a drink. Yeah, good time for a drink. All right, before our intro started playing again. <laughs> yeah, okay. So <laughs> um, back to the, the description. Um, so basically, it's, a, it's an exploration of, of how they did this. And... Um, Exploring it in, in multiple different ways. So it's uh, exploring the, the quarries and seeing what we can figure out from the quarries about how things were created, how they were moved. Mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, doing and using laser scanners, photogrammetry, a number of different techniques to, to really analyze this in a scientific way. 
But then also uh, to go scuba diving in the places that we determined are the most likely places that if the Egyptians lost something, they probably would have lost it there. So basically where their docks were and stuff would fall off the docks. Exactly, because if, if you're trying to, the most likely place to have an accident if you're loading a thousand ton obelisk onto a boat just using ropes mm -hmm. is probably when you're loading it on the boat or getting it off the boat. So what did you guys find? Uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out they did lose stuff uh, off the boats. So a lot of what we were doing was we were going into these quarries and uh, we were uh, first determining, okay, what, what was extracted from here? How big was it? What was its size? And there were lots of existing academic theories about how the Egyptians moved things like a thousand ton obelisk out of the quarry. Mm -hmm. So we were able to scan all of these items, like some of the unfinished obelisks, et cetera, and then create a 3D model. This is all on a boat where we were staying on this the Nile. Is underwater. No, this is above water. Okay. This is before we could do the underwater. So we take a giant obelisk and we take the 3D model of it and we'd say, okay, well, this academic paper thinks that they went, you know, to the south and they went around some bend and then that, that's where they loaded it up. So we'd make the model and then we'd, and we'd also create a 3D model of, of, the train. of the train and then we'd try to move it and we'd discover things like, oh, it's actually too long. There's no way to get it around this corner. Uh -huh. So this, this route's impossible. And then we'd try another route and we'd say like, okay, well, this grade, this goes up to like a 15% grade. They would need, you know, I'm guessing four times as many people uh, in order to drag it up, up this grade. So they probably didn't do it that way. So it was kind of figuring out where's the most likely place where they, they built a little harbor that they would use to load these boats. Mm -hmm. So before we did anything else, it was trying to figure out where is this likely to be? And we did that using testing in the field, uh, using all of these scanning techniques. Once we determined that, uh, Kevin Kane uh, brought in a very special scanner. Uh, so, you know, we all know that there's laser scanners and stuff like that for right. above water. Then there's things like sonar that tells you where the, the, the pathometry, the bottom mm -hmm. uh, of the river or lake might be. Um, and there's uh, also scanners that can scan below the ground. If you have dry sand, you can scan, see what's beneath the ground. Mm -hmm. This was a unique scanner, the only one in the world that would scan both through the water and then through silt hmm. and then give you reflections off from uh, stone or metal that was beneath the silt. So then we used this, well, not me, I wasn't involved in this part of the project, but they scanned uh, back and forth in the water to figure out where all the hard objects were uh, beneath the silt. And then for the project, they got a dive permit. Uh, and it's the first time this area's ever, anyone's ever gone scuba diving in this area. Because it's just the middle of nowhere desert. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you're not allowed to go scuba diving in the Nile. That's, really? That's illegal. Yeah. You, uh, it's illegal? Yeah. They, they don't want, uh, basically you have to get a permit. They that's... don't want people like treasure hunting, basically. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you have to get a permit for this. So the film paid for the permit, which the permits are pretty expensive. So the uh, film was able to pay for the permit. So the archaeologist or the uh, Egyptologist working on the project was able to get all of this information because of this documentary was willing to pay for the permit so that hmm. we could create interesting entertainment, right? So this is kind of one of the ways that archaeology happens is it gets paid for by the creation of a documentary. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, so they, they would then, once we figured out, we'd, we'd narrow it down by coming up with our best guess of where this might have been done, then it was scanned, uh, then divers went down and actually uh, looked for uh, hidden objects. So what, you know, I'm interested about this scanner because you said it's mm -hmm. the only one in the world. Yeah. It's like, it has to be some sort of sonar, right? So, yeah. Uh, side scan type thing, but mm -hmm. they just have, they have some processing on the back end that really yeah. picks up the, the stuff below the silt. That's right. That's right. And um, uh, maybe one day you'll have Kevin Kane come in here and give you like the intimate details because. That'd be interesting. I did a project yeah. on side scan sonar in uh, undergrad. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, 
Yeah, it's, that's a, an area of interest to me personally. Oh, great. But that, that's fascinating that they can do all that. Yeah, and so uh, this is kind of the basis of the documentary. It's trying to figure out how did they get these things onto boats and mm -hmm. really doing uh, detailed documentation that's both useful for the archaeology, so is more maybe even more thorough than you would need for just making the documentary. Um, and that was useful to Philippe. So we, a lot of what we captured was like uh, stuff that Philippe could use uh, and stuff that would be also interesting to expose in the documentary. So now, um, when you went diving, were you able to do... No, no, no. I did not go diving. go diving. So the permit requires that anyone that goes diving, they have to be Egyptian. Huh. <laughs> That's a requirement. So, so my question was going to be, uh, are, are, were you able to do photogrammetry on the, on the pictures that came out of the dives? I did not, but you certainly could. And I do a lot of uh, underwater photogrammetry now. Back then, I was not doing that. Okay. Uh, but I do that now. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So, so tell us a little bit about the VR um, environment. It's an app, right? Yeah, so it's a little application I built. Um, so uh, for me, this is, uh, well, one, on, on the project, I, I, this, this one spot. Um, so on, on our project, uh, we stayed on a boat in the Nile, and mm -hmm. I just slept on the deck of the boat. It was wonderful. Yeah. Only way you can stay cool is to sleep outside. <laughs> and um, this was really close to where we were moored. And um, I was able to uh, go there several times at, uh, you know, six o'clock in the morning when the sun was rising. And uh, the tombs were set up so that the sun, at a certain time of year, the sun would just come straight down. I can't remember now if it was the solstice or the equinox, but the, the, the sun would just basically shoot straight down uh, right, Indiana Jones style with the yeah, yeah, totally perfect, perfect shot. And so I I went there in the morning and I was just blown away by and this is the tomb of the unknown merchant. Yes, yeah, of the uh, middle management. Middle management. <laughs> <laughs> the tomb of middle management. Okay. Uh, so I I go into that. I went into that tomb one morning, and I once I'd been there earlier when Philippe was giving me all the detail of like what this was, and I thought it was beautiful and interesting. But when I saw it in the morning, all the reflected light just like made my heart skip a beat, you know? It, it, was, it was just this magical moment. Uh, I ran back and grabbed my camera, came back, and it was like, okay, it's, it's, it's over now. So it's like this short period of like 10, 12 minutes where, where it, it just looks incredible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was really hard to get 10 or 12 minutes to go shoot that when um, when you're on a production Cause because you're working every every minute is scheduled yeah. like you're just from pre-dawn you know until long after dark you're you're busy on things but one morning I did have that that little bit of time and that's what I chose to do with my time is to go and shoot that uh, with the expectation that one day I'd be able to make something uh, really special from it and uh, when VR, uh, so VR has been around for actually a long time, but mainly used by NASA and the military and not by common people and the graphics capability was not that impressive. Mm -hmm. um, but about, I'm guessing seven years ago now, six, seven years ago, all that changed uh, with Oculus and uh, now VR is something you can get for 300 bucks and consumers are using it, it's being used across all kinds of industries. It's, it's, it's an incredible storytelling platform. It, it is a lot. It's a lot of different things. The applications are of virtual reality are only as varied as the applications of reality. Uh, so it's kind of good for everything. And um, when that first came out, I thought this piece is what I want to see in virtual reality. I want to experience that 12 minutes that I had in that tomb, you know, in the morning in Egypt, and I want to be able to share that with people. I want to be able to put other people in that and have them share and see what I saw. Um, yeah. 
so that's the first thing I did with VR. I mean, I, mean, I did spherical movies before that. So, but exactly. I mean, that has that has tremendous implications, right? Yes. Because that means that anybody can really get off the beaten path. Yeah. And see that, and you can share that with them in a way that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Like it's not, you know, people say you had to be there, you know, and and that's true. Like a picture can't express, but this picture and this method gets pretty close. Yes. Right. Absolutely, and um, it's it's used in so many different ways for communication like that. Uh, so the the other presentation I gave on the Mogao Caves, uh, the primary purpose of creating that virtual reality piece, which is much more elaborate and maybe even more impressive than this one, is that it, it was being used so that people could understand how valuable this artwork is mm. and protect it, because not everybody has a chance to go to, you know, the northwestern China to go and experience the Mogao Caves themselves. But if you can bring this to potential philanthropists, they might fund the protection of these sites. That's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> that's so pretty cool. That's, and, that's, what, my, that's what I dedicated my life to. You can share it with more people. <laughs> and, you know, like these sites, obviously, you know, they, they, they're impacted by tourism, right? Yes. Well, now someone can get 95% of that experience without having to go there. Yeah. And, I mean, going to Mogao, for example, I mean, or, or Gabal Sisala, it's like, it's a lot of time and a lot of money yeah. and a lot of discomfort. But that's what we like here in the Adventurers Club, right? Well, we're that stuff. for adventurers, that's yeah. We're but gonna for the rest we're of the gonna world, go, yeah. but not everybody feels that way, and a lot of people would love to have the experience, um, and they won't get the full benefit that we do. I mean, nobody. I don't. I don't claim that anyone who experiences this in VR experiences exactly what I experienced when I was there. Um, there's, there's something that's even more magical about being there. But for me to be able to go back anytime, I mean, it's half for me of yeah. just like, I can put on that headset and I can be there again. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's, uh, in a, even in a very selfish way, I, I like that a lot. So, so uh, is this available to people? Like if they have a VR headset, how would they, how would they go about seeing this? Any, anyone watching here, if you want to see this, when we open up, I'll, I'll bring this in. But I mean, there's you like a lot of VR it. platforms, right? Are you like on a platform? Like, can I spend 99 cents or five bucks and and you know go go get the um, Tomb of Middle Management experience? <laughs> it is not yet, but if there's enough interest, I might do that. Um, why? Why not? I mean, that, that I I can certainly maybe with a little bit of lead, uh, time in advance, I could make this available to anyone in the club who wants to who sweet. has a headset and wants to experience it. Sweet. I'm going to be asking you for it. Yeah. Because I've got my headset now. Just yeah. Gotta, All right. Got to finish a couple more pieces on my computer. Yeah. Okay. So your girlfriend's here tonight, Grace. And, yep. And she's going to actually go through this experience for us. Right? Yeah. And, um, and, and kind of show everybody what it's like. Thank you, Grace, for, for helping us out here. She's, she's off, off screen here. Yeah. And um, so there's Grace. She's got, she's got her cyborg headset on with her sweet mask. And um, do we have anything on the computer, Andy, so we can see what she's doing in there? There it is. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Yay. So let's take a look at that. All right. So this is where they would use their knives to carve out and either sharpen their knives or uh, use that to collect magic sand. And Grace, if you would uh, maybe just kind of look around generally. And uh, yeah, so there yeah, we've got the Nile. Water? So okay, so this can you look at the water, Grace? So now, the water is like completely. Um, that's okay, Andy. That is computer generated, but it reflects the real world. So I, I took real photography of what you really see when you're looking out that doorway. Now that doorway actually would have been much more narrow. Someone lived here at some point and knocked out the surrounding wall to make the opening larger. Hmm. Um, and if you turn to your left, Grace, there we see some, you know, maybe go all the way around so you don't get taken in the cable. And uh, see, so here we've got other niches. You can see down there's a tomb or where bodies would be placed. 
down there. Um, and then dark, deep in that dark shadow, you can see there are three more statues. So we've got a group of three there. And to her left, you've got a group of three. So if you go into, Grace, can you go down into one of these antechambers and then turn around? She needs like a handler over here. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that works. She's, she, she's down there. Uh, <laughs> now go into one of those like side rooms. So, so like how many rooms is in this? Well, there's kind of three niches and then one of them split open so wide from the earthquake that there's actually an opening and yeah, that's let's how I see that opening. Yeah, so Grace, maybe you uh, go to your left. Can you put her in the picture in picture, Andy? <laughs> this is fantastic. So this is what Grace is doing and, and you know. Uh, yeah, so there we go. There, this is the, where the earthquake, so kind of look up a little bit. And so we see the statues on the right. And then if you look left, you see the statues on the left side where it was pushed back from the earthquake. Yeah, you're good right, right there. You're at the steps. Yeah, so, you know. yeah. Uh, don't, don't look up. That gives away, that breaks the illusion. Oh, uh, oh there's, there's some spots that, yeah, don't, there's some glitches don't in the look, matrix. Don't look behind the curtain, you know. <laughs> look, don't swipe left, don't swipe right. Just look at the picture. Yeah, okay. so. Um, look at this little thing. Well, that, yeah, so that's, that's the statue. And that's one and a half statues right there. You can see the half statue. That's it, huh? Wow, this is, this is crazy. I'm telling you, I'm really in Egypt right now. <laughs> so, so you've done two of these. I've done dozens of little VR, like, vignettes. Yeah. Like this, yeah. Um, but we need to get those on the Internet. So people can see them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I've got stuff. I, or I, just give them to me. I, I don't care about I, everybody else. Oh, yeah. I'll <laughs> give them to you. That, but I've got lots of material that a lot of my material is part of bigger projects um, where, um, you know, the other people are... are walk, walk back towards us, Grace. Like, I got a... a like, where are you? Uh, straight ahead. <laughs> There's a tomb there. <laughs> Well, the neat thing about this one is you can kind of get as close as you want to everything in that space. Now, how long does it take you? One, okay, so how many pictures did you say this was stitched yeah, together? About 500. So 500 pictures. How long yeah. does it take to make that world these days? Oh, I, I probably spent a couple of weeks on this one. But this is, like this is a small space, so it was relatively easy. Stitching all the pictures easy. together yeah. and everything and making sure that it doesn't do anything weird. There's touch-up. you got to do a lot of touch-up. Yeah. But we can probably end the VR. Yeah, I... Thank you, Grace. We yeah, appreciate, thank you. We appreciate that you was great. Wandering around Egypt for us. Yes. And and and, and tripping around the Adventures Club. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, anyways, I had a great time doing this project. And when I when I finished this the first time, so this is the first piece I got into VR where it was. Okay. So another uh, technical thing is. Uh, we, we call things either three off, three degrees of freedom, like uh -huh. uh, uh, pan, tilt, roll of your head. Yeah, there's only three. Right? Yeah. But then there's six degrees of freedom, which is the same thing, pan, tilt, roll, but also forward, back, left, right, up, down. Yeah, it's still only three degrees. Well, <laughs> it's... it's, it's on, I'm just giving I'm, you a hard time yeah. because I'm a system Trans engineer, I'm a controls guy, and there's yeah. three degrees. Translation nine, and six, rotation. All this crap. Yeah. So you multiply those and you get six. Oh, yeah, I see. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, before this, I was doing three degrees where you just would look around, but this one is six degrees, which allows you to get as close as you want. And as soon as you do that, it just, the realism goes through the roof because there are subtle movements that you do that your brain compensates for that tells you things are real. So like even just like taking a breath, you think you're being still, but you're, when you're breathing, your head's moving and your brain is kind of subtracting that out of what you're seeing. Uh -huh. And that tells you like, this is real. When you're in a six degree of freedom VR experience, when you breathe, you actually, it changes your view. And so your brain is, is like agreeing, saying like, oh, okay, this is right. This is the real so world. So it's one more thing that sells the illusion. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it sells it in the, 
pretty significant way and suddenly makes everything in the world feel very natural where mostly when we deal with computers, we're dealing with interfaces and little barriers that are present, preventing us from dealing with the world in the way that we deal with the world in reality. Well, once, once you have all six degrees of freedom, you're actually just kind of dealing with the world the same way you do in the real world. Yeah. I know I've, I've done one of these VR, ex I've done the VR experience at uh, Disneyland where you're like uh, uh, in Star Wars or whatever, mm -hmm. you're running around with a blaster. And it, they sell, it, it's amazing, they sell, there's something in front of you, right? And you reach out and touch it, and it's there. Yeah. Because they've built, they built the fake world, and if you take off your helmet, nothing's painted, it's all like just primed, you know, it doesn't, yeah. it's not actually painted. But in the, in the helmet, it's you all real. Like you're there. Yeah. So I mean, I that really sold the illusion to me. Oh, that's like you know you reach like you see this robot and you reach out and touch R two D two and you're like oh oh crap, as soon it's as there. as soon as you add touch heat heat's uh -huh. amazing um, all all of these things like as you add more fill in more and more of the pieces your your brain just buys it more and more. So what do you think the next major evolution in this is going to be that really sells the illusion? Like you mentioned that the moving to the um, you know translational motion. Is the is the next big thing? Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's what and, we, and can we, that with, with, we can do now. We saw that with can do that with now. Grace moving around this yep. the, the area. Yep. But what's the next big one? Like, what what what, what do they need to do? Well, to this really is really sell this. This is still going to get better and better. So, right now, there are things like a small number of people still get sick because there's subtle lags between when you move your head and when the image moves. So there's things like that that will change over time and get better. Um, uh -huh. But as far as adding senses, once you have really accurate sound and you have vision, those are the ones that we depend on the most. Uh, but uh, being able to touch things, I think that w w for me, one of the big in in a inhibition or... Innovations. Uh, no, uh, I, like one of the uh, biggest problems, barriers okay. to, to VR is that you want to walk around the way you walk around in real life. And um, in this piece, I built this specifically because it was so intimate and so small that you can experience it in VR. And you don't have to use any tool to move your body to the next space. Okay. So often where you're experiencing VR, you're in a smaller space than the real space you want to explore. So there's a very clever technique that's called teleportation where you press a button and an art comes out of your hand and you see where it intersects the ground and when you let go of the button, you teleport to that spot. Right. And that's super efficient, allow you to explore huge, vast areas even though the room you're standing in is only 12 by 12. It's almost like the equivalent of picking up your mouse and moving yes. it to another part of the yes. desk, which we actually do seamlessly now, I don't know. Yeah. When you use your mouse on your desk and you run out of space, yeah, you seamlessly you lift move it. it. Yeah, you, you don't lift even think. It. You don't even think it. But the thing is that when you do that in VR, although it's super efficient, we need to do that right now, it breaks a little bit of the illusion. Like when you walk into a room, like as you're walking, when you're watching, as you're walking, there's all that parallax information. As you're moving, you're getting all kinds of information about that room, and you lose that when you go into this teleport mode. So I think that and there's a lot of innovation. This is all on the cusp. So they'll do things. Uh, there's things that you can do graphics. I, this is in a tech. We need to get back to Egypt talk. And really? I don't know. I mean, this is, this is, this, this is getting right? a little technical right now. But uh, you can do things like you can move the room a certain amount every time you take a step and you won't notice, which is you can move it like just like a degree and a half with every footfall. And the person uh, experiencing it won't know that happened. They'll be positive that they're walking in a straight line, but every step they're turning a little bit. So you can use this to make people walk in figure eight patterns. You can also slightly move the world if you're watching their eyeballs, which is another innovation in headsets is eye tracking. Mm -hmm. And it can tell when you blink. And every time you blink, it shifts the world a little bit. So like as you're walking around, you may be in a 20 foot space, but it can have you walking in figure eights while you're 100% sure you're walking in a straight line. That's fascinating. And this, it's basically hacking perception. Right. It, it's paying a lot of attention to how we perceive the world and hacking it. Um, and you can also do it with stochastic 
motion of your eyes, where your eyes are racing around. So um, when your eyes move, you just shift the perspective a little bit, a little bit further than your eyes actually moved, and you didn't actually notice. Yeah, it. and you but can I would easily test people, to people see. People would get sick at a certain point, right? Actually, that does not make them sick. Huh. You, would, you you might anticipate that, but it doesn't. That's so, pretty cool. But that just changes that. So, so you would need a smaller room to experience a bigger space. Yeah. And what, that's the big limitation what, right what now. Kind of, what size space would you need with all those technologies to actually be able to basically explore infinity with that? And, and this thing walks around a figure eight. Yeah. Like what's the radius or the diameter of that figure eight? <laughs> you know, without <laughs> the studies in front of me, like I, I, I probably can't uh, say that accurately. I know that it's bigger than what I have in my living room, which is about... I don't know, 12 feet or something like that. The other one is the big giant hamster ball, right? That you just put people in the yeah, hamster that, ball and that's another walk option. But that, that's a lot more. It's a lot of equipment, right? That's a lot of equipment I don't think consumers are going to buy. Yeah. I think this other technique of it's called redirected walking. Huh. Uh, so, this, if you look at all the scientific papers, it's all about redirected walking, how you get people to believe that they're in a bigger space than they really are. That's fascinating. And it works. I've done it, I've, I've, I've used it, and it. It's totally convincing. And to me, that's one of the big limitations about having experiences now. Because I, um, there's another headset that's wireless mm -hmm. uh, called the Quest 2, which is kind of what I would recommend to anyone thinking of, like, I want to experience this, get a Quest 2. Um, and uh, that it runs on infrared, which means that it doesn't work in direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to be used indoors. But if you wait until a really cloudy day or twilight, and go out to the beach or a park or something and use it, you basically have limitless expanse to explore. And uh, when you have a big space that you're exploring, that is so much more meaningful and you're, you're kind of overwhelmed with the reality of it in a way that teleporting doesn't kind of interferes. Teleporting is convenient, it's a shortcut and it's awesome, but right. it doesn't sell your senses in the same way. That's interesting. Man, so, you know, this, this really is going to change a lot, right? Like, I think a lot of us adventurers are kind of going to be uh, resistant to it because you're like, oh, you got to get out there. Is, do, you, do you encounter that when you, when you present that to people? Like, well, there's nothing like the real thing, you know, this is you all know, just, or is it an extension of photography and videography and all that? It is. I mean, like, as humans, what we love, we love repetition. Like, we love to have the same experience multiple ways. So we'll get interested in place and we'll read about it and we'll envision it in our, our mind's eye. And then we'll look at pictures of it. And that's another way to, and that, that kind of enriches our experiences. Look at paintings of it. Well, here, you know, people tell all kinds of tales. I mean, what we're doing right now, talking, you know, telling stories about yeah. these places, watching videos about them, looking at stills of them. VR is just one more step in that progression of us reliving that experience and, and, and also experiencing it in advance before we go there. Um, and then, then having our own experience when we actually do arrive. Um, so it, it's, I just think of it as a way of making the experience more rich. So one of the things, like uh, not this piece, but like the uh, piece that I was showing on Mogao, this is used by researchers because they, they have limited time in these caves because everyone's exhalations damages the caves and mm -hmm. there are also tourists and, and other, you know, there's a lot of demand to go into the cave. So you can't spend, you know, two hours in there if you want to study something. Um, but a researcher might go into the VR experience spend two hours there, and then come away with maybe one question they want to answer. And then when they get their opportunity to walk in the cave, they can walk directly to the spot that they've already been thinking about, already been researching, and go and see it for real, and be able to verify all their ideas about it. And huh. so it's, it's no different, to me, it's no different than looking at maps, doing research, looking at photographs, listening to stories, all of these things are, are all just kind of steps in our human drive to like re-experience something over and over again in a new way before we really experience or even after we experience it. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I, some I next like, level stuff. This is I, I feel like it only right makes here, my personal experiences more valuable. Yeah. Like it makes it makes those those minutes that I had in the location, it it enhances them. It doesn't detract. Yeah. And I, I don't under I don't understand the argument of it detracting, other than maybe like you know, there's something that might make you say like, well, I, I don't want this place to exist for anyone else. I want it to only be mine. Like that's, that's. Oh, that's an argument, you know? Yeah, people, sure. People you can go into argument. a cathedral and burn it down when you leave. I yeah. mean. You hear about the guy, I, I think it was some sort of, uh, you know, bird collector or something like that, that he found the last of a species. Right, right. And he, and he, and he, and he shoots it because, you know, now he's got right. the last one. <laughs> right. I think that's like such outrageous, uh, selfish uh, behavior that, yeah, it know, happens. It happens. It does. It does. So, so you had you, you you have another um, thing that you brought in tonight. The the you said you found the Egyptian IKEA manual. Can oh, you, right. Can you the title. It? We should get around. To yeah, the title of this title. talk. I mean, we've been a lot of places tonight, <laughs> but um, you, well, and we haven't looked at any images at all. Um, I mean, well, you know, VR is worth a thousand words, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so let's see. Maybe we could bring up. Um, there's, well, you went some, some places. You went on a balloon ride when you were there. We'll we'll, we'll show that one real quick. You you went you went on a balloon ride. Oh, over Luxor, okay. Right? So this is after after the documentary project. Uh -huh. So uh, I worked on a documentary project. Made a lot of great friends with everyone working on that. Uh, we went and we traveled around. This one actually, I think I did by myself. But I wanted to fly over Hatshepsut's tomb, and. Um, because the hardest thing in photogrammetry is getting aerials. So I went With out... With drones? You know, you'd think that would be a great idea until you go to Egypt. Um, They're not big on drones there? Yeah, I'll, I'll show you a, <laughs> a little of what we went through in the documentary uh, after this. But yeah, getting in the air was pretty difficult. So I booked a, a balloon flight, and then the, here's some images, and we can just... You know, kind of tab through some of and what these. And what, what did you see on this balloon flight? So this is a dawn balloon flight. And as a photographer, I was amazed by what uh, a balloon can do as a photography platform. It's pretty stable, huh? It's so stable and steady. And unlike any other aerial platform, it's just like... You mean the drone doing this? Yeah, the drones bouncing around, helicopters, all that stuff. Yeah. Everything, every time I've been in the air, you're always bouncing around. Nice and stable and smooth as silk. Um, so I did a dawn uh, uh, balloon ride, uh, and this is in Luxor. Um, this is an archaeological site that we're looking at. Um, if we can advance yeah. through these, because I think there's a few of them. But we uh, talked about we talked about the ancient like what, what's this IKEA manual you found? Right. Okay. They, so that's going to get they back, put together take us crappy back furniture to the, too to the documentary. <laughs> so um, okay. So uh, there's a video in there. Um, we'll let him bring it up. We won't wait for him. But what what what, what was the IKEA manual? Okay. So this is the deal. So the whole thing was like we're trying to figure out how uh, they move these all of these monuments. Like, how do they move these monuments uh, out over the water or onto, onto ships and, and move them around Egypt? So right. the, the funny thing is that, you know, and working with Philippe was great because he's this Egyptologist and, you know, he, I just got little hints from him all the time. So one, of the, one day we're working and we start walking back and he's like, we're going this way. And I'm like, that's not the way back. He's like, oh, it's okay. He's like, you know, every time I walk through... So basically, there's the debris field from this quarry. That it's just like a mile of okay. nothing but but just broken rock everywhere. Mm -hmm. And every single day, when he walked out to the site and he walked back, he would take a different route every single time, because maybe he'll find something. Maybe hmm. he'll just stumble across something. So one night or one afternoon, like walking back, um, he notices something. He's like, that's an unusual pile of rocks. And I looked at it and I'm like, that is a pile of rocks. <laughs> you know, like there's, how is that unusual? There's just rock, there's freaking rocks everywhere you look. Just right. nothing but piles of rocks. He's like, no, that one's weird. And 
so the others, everybody is like, okay. And he's like, pull these rocks back. And they're like, uh, all right, well, so we'll start pulling all these, you know. I mean, they weren't that big, but they were probably, you know, right. a foot and a half. You know, so we start pulling all these rocks back from this big boulder. And sure enough, his eye, he was able to spot it. it was, someone was hiding something. Um, so someone had basically stolen something and then rolled all these rocks over it to hide their theft. So we roll the, the stones back, and there's a, a steely, which is um, uh, uh, basically like a, not quite a column, but like a wide, um, almost like a headstone, but bigger, okay. um, uh, that has hieroglyphics all over it. And it had tilted over at a, an extreme angle, kind of like this. And so we pulled all the rocks back, and there's hieroglyphics all over it, and there's a big pictograph on the side. And the hieroglyphics uh, described exactly how they loaded monoliths oh. <laughs> onto boats. So it described this in hieroglyphics, so the written word. And then on the facing panel, there was an Ikea manual of how do you load In a... Swedish. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no text. All illustration. Like, this is how you load an obelisk onto a boat. Hmm. And so it's, it's a visual description of that. So uh, this was a major find, and, and Philippe said, you know, this is something that will go into the front of... Egyptology textbooks from here on out. This is like, this is a significant, like there's lots of illustrations all over Egypt of moving all these monuments on boats. Like they know they moved them up and down Egypt on boats. They extracted them mostly around this place just north of Aswan, uh, which is uh, Gebel Sicilla. And they, uh, so they knew those pieces, but they never knew how they actually got them onto boats. So this is an illustration that explains that. So how'd they get them onto boats? You never guess. Thousands of guys with ropes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, they kind of load them, load them on, put the, the monument on a sled, and they would put sand down in front of the sled, and they'd wet the sand, uh, and then you'd have thousands of guys pulling it. So um, there's two pieces I have this of this. One, one video, if you could pull it up. I think you got that video you were looking for, right? Is this, is this the one? Okay, yeah, this is perfect. This is the right, one we're talking about. So I'll, I'll talk through this if you want to play it. So this is the Stila falling down forwards. It's kind of like working under a car. So there's the camera I was using to photograph it. So I tracked the actual position when I took each photograph. So on the left, you're going to see the position of the camera when I took the photograph. In the middle, what you see is the 20 megapixel photograph. And then on the right, what you see is a 3D model extracted. Uh, we actually, I think, extracted this one using laser scanning, but you could do it with photogrammetry as well. And then you see kind of where that frame of the photograph ends up in the image. So uh, this is something that we kind of had to do impromptu. And so you can see that I kind of concentrated the photography over the hieroglyphics so we could get extremely high resolution of the hieroglyphics so that we could examine it in post and off location. Um, so this is all seamlessly merged uh, wow. together. So that is the hieroglyphic portion. Now on the right side of that piece is the IKEA manual. And for that, maybe we'll switch over to the laptop. Yeah, go get that laptop. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pull up. So Andy, can you swap our uh, connection over to the laptop again? So while we're here, it's the Rich Mayfield Show again while we uh, do tech stuff here. Right now, Greg's over there pulling up a special app that he has on his laptop, and now we have it. Okay, so uh, for this, you can still hear me, right? Yep. Um, we, we took a special kind of image. So uh, this was photographed uh, uh, by Mark Eagle, and... Um, this was uh, unfortunately after I left. 
So we, we kind of came up with the best technique for photographing this. Because one of the things about this particular image is if you look at this, it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on. We see a bunch of figures. We see some flying saucers. You were right. Yeah. That is how they did this. I know it. Okay. Uh, so we see boats, obviously, uh, with monuments on them. Uh, but it's hard to see anything else. So this image, what we did was we locked off the camera. Uh, we put uh, uh, cue balls, which Kevin had to find somewhere in Gabel Sicilia. I don't know how he found those. Uh, but uh, we kind of came up with this technique. Well, the technique existed, but we decided this was the right one when we were on location. We weren't prepared for it before we got there. Uh, but what I've got in the upper right-hand corner here is a little control that allows me to relight the photograph after it was taken. So oh, wow. I took a limited, well, I didn't. Mark took a limited number of uh, photographic angles, and then we can drag this around and relight it. So you get the, some valuable information when you get these raking angles. So right. if I zoom into a part here, we get these raking angles. You can see the thousands of guys with ropes uh, dragging... Uh, the monument around. So now, how many photos is this? A, c c so you re you actually relit the photo. Yes. And then and then took another picture. And now now that's all composited together, and you and you can move between those angles. That's right. So you can see you can kind of see how it was done from. The, we normally we crop this ball out, but just for but explanation. But the, the cue balls, the 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 shadow off the cue balls, your reference to know where your yes. light was. So that tells us where the light was. And you can kind of see different lights appearing in that ball as I move the light around. So now this definitely looks continuous, but how many actual photos? I think this is around 35, some, somewhere in there. Um, but allows you to see things like here, we've got someone with an injured knee and we can kind of really get a sense for that. Now, sometimes it's still hard to see even when you change the lighting. So th this technique also allows us to change the surface material um, so I can make it reflective rather than flat and matte. So this allows us to see a lot more of the carving. Now there's 3D data in here too. Or um, no? there for every pixel, we know the orientation of that pixel, but it's not actual like 3D information. Okay. Um, so we can look at a representation that tells us, um, uh, this next one will, Red, green, and blue tells us the orientation of each pixel. So, so there's a guy with a broken knee in here. Where, where is that? Yeah, it's up. Is that is that like the 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 OSHA sign equivalent? And so, is this like a this is like an OSHA sign back there? Where yeah. It's like, don't hurt your knee loading stuff on. Well, somehow they're yeah they're describing how someone's leg is hurt, and there's somebody kind of working on their leg. It's like it's um, a warning. It's like, hey, a bunch of people are going to mess up their knees. Yeah. Go treat them over here in the medical tent. But And we also can see clearly what's going on the the boat or flying saucer, if you will. Um, uh-huh. So we can see that really clearly. But, wow. And then there's, <laughs> there's something that's really faint up here, which is, and this is really hard to see. Even in reality, it's hard to see. But there is a person standing on the top uh, of that monument. So if I drag the light around, you can kind of get a sense for like two legs, like a leg here and here, yeah. kind of the skirt here. And so that is uh, a person with one arm up high. So that's a small person, maybe a child, that is kind of directing the work of all of those workers. So, so this is, some, you know, if, if someone just took a picture and then you were some researcher and... A, and you a, would never see that. You'd never see it. But with this, you can actually move the light around and really, like, what is that? And yep. get into it. Yep. Wow. That's right. So that's, Now, what app is this? Is this, a, is this a custom app or is that some sort of... Yeah, it's called... Uh, uh, there's an um, organization called Cultural Heritage Imaging. And they create a bunch of resources for creating these types of images. It's used for pictographs and a lot of different cultural heritage. So they developed this app specifically for, for the application? That yeah, actually, saw. the original guy uh, who did it, his name was uh, 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 Malzberg from uh, uh, HP Labs. And he did that as a graphics experiment. And then Cultural Heritage Imaging is a nonprofit that had popped up to basically 
um, try to apply this hmm. technology to cultural heritage. Um, so the trick there was that we didn't plan on doing, normally I have a flash that I do this with that's so bright that it's brighter than the sun. So it yeah. overwhelms the sun. So this one, like we had to, they had to come back at night. Uh, my contract was up, so I was out of there. I, I was going. You didn't stick around to do, do more of this? Well, you know, I was, I, I, there are other things I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Mount Sinai. Um, uh -huh. I climbed Mount Sinai. This was all um, part of that same trip. Yeah, it's all part of the same trip. But uh, so I wanted to go up Sinai. I wanted to go scuba diving in the Red Sea. I wanted to go and see Luxor. And I wanted to see Hatshepsut's tomb. I wanted to, like, so I had two weeks. Basically, I worked on the project for two weeks. And then I had two weeks to goof off mm -hmm. in Egypt. So goofing off was kind of important. So now when you goof off, you, yep. are, are you um, taking these, these VR? Always. Yeah, that's the thing now, everywhere yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has been for a long time. You know, but the Adventurers Club could yeah. use one of these experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, I, we've always thought that it'd be cool to walk around here. Yeah. I mean, there's a billion stories in here. I mean, this place is amazing. How long would it take you to photograph this whole place so someone could walk around it oh, reasonably well? You know, I might spend, I don't know, five days. There's so, the thing is, there's so many details that you would want to get those details really well mm -hmm. because you would be telling a story about them. Right. Um, so, uh, and actually just layering all the other information about each artifact here would be the that would be the time consuming part is putting all that in hmm. but it's uh, an idea though huh yeah <laughs> oh so um is is there a video there that looks like it's that uh stila another or steely um steely's is, is, how do you spell that steely so the whole time like we're steely in Egypt, uh you know my French Egyptologist friend kept on saying, saying it. I always thought he was saying Stella. And it wasn't until like months later when he finally corrected me. He's like, no, Stella is a beer. He's like, this, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's steely is the way that it's pronounced. Uh, you can also pronounce it Stell. Um, but it's basically a, um, a, a vertical... Uh, placard or I don't know how you would describe it. But. Now what's like a, what, what is a cenotaph? I've heard that oh, used before. That's, I, what is a that's, cenotaph? That's a false tomb, I believe. So that, that's basically something that is like a tomb that is a memorial to the dead. Ah, uh, yeah, but yeah. Does not, it does not necessarily contain the dead. That makes sense. So these are cenotaphs. Okay. Like what I was showing was a cenotaph. Is this that video you were looking for? It's not. <laughs> no, it's not. But and that's, build on it. <laughs> I don't that's know where okay. it is. Well, why, why don't we just tab through a bunch of pictures? Maybe we let the pictures drive the story. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is the outside of that tomb. So, so Okay, so this is what Grace was walking around in. And yeah. this was the door that she was looking out at. Yep. So basically, we're in the water. Is this the image that you use to reflect off the water? No, I used one that I shot from the doorway looking out at the water. But I mean, but you said the water. This is reflects. down in papyrus reeds. You, you said stuff. you said that the water reflects reality. It does, it does. And this, oh, this is the. And this the, is this is the same same one from further away, so you can see all the reeds. Mm -hmm. So I stood in the doorway, photographed everything outside the doorway. I didn't see doorway. those reeds in the virtual reality experience. Are you saying it's not? They're lower. You actually don't uh, see them when you're in there because the the tomb is kind of up high, so that the the the, um, the Nile would raise really significantly. It's it's got to be like thirty feet or something, um, but it was a, it was a significant height. Let's so see. this tomb was built to flush itself. Is that what you're saying? Well, the you know the the ancients there believed that um, the uh, uh, all the silt from the Nile because it would make everything grow. Um, they believe that that was a, um, it brought them fertility and that it would help them. And it, it was the fertility that they needed to continue to live in the afterlife. Hmm. So if you're going to be buried, you want to be buried someplace where you get re-silted every year so that you have energy saved up for the afterlife. Huh. It's the end of the af Oh, here we go. There's one. We oh, okay. This is, yeah, this, this is video. great. This is the finding of, um, that piece. Go ahead, Andy. Afternoon in Gebel Selsile. 
Philip has been exploring the surroundings and signaled a find to the rest of the team. He spotted a pharaoh's stell, unknown to Egyptologists. In the center, there were very fine reliefs. On the right, an outstanding image showing work in the quarries. The most important thing is that this object has a rounded end. It looks like a stele, and it was clearly put on a sled. The person in front is maneuvering it, and he looks as if he's pouring water in front of it so that it slides better. And there are a number of individuals, an Egyptian-style representation of what looked like two rows of people pulling on a rope, and the stele will be towed down a slight slope to the quayside, where there's a boat moored. We have the beginning of the process and the end, when the operation being described has been completed. There's nothing else like this? I don't know of any other monument or description like this. We have depictions that show objects already on a boat, but nothing that shows them being loaded. There's the main character, the site manager, and he's making a speech. He's shown speaking to the scribes there who are busy taking notes. So they're taking orders, and his lieutenant is a small young man, possibly his son, following behind him. There you can see how important he is, the man in charge. There's one nice little detail. Here you can see that while the main operation is underway, someone's been injured in the quarry and another person is treating his leg. So you're happy? Oh yes, and it was sheer luck when you're walking along and you see something weird and it turns out to be a really surprising find. Today the Stella's face down but you can imagine it at the top of a huge pillar of rock. And some of the fragments are still there. It would have topped the Pharaoh's quarry, a memorial celebrating the king's work and thanking the divine mountain for its help. In the evening, by superimposing dozens of digital images on top of each other, this the is photographers photo managed to create a three-dimensional replica of the stele. So this is your stuff? This is my stuff, but there's, yeah. The name of Ramses II features on it, as does that of his foreman. So if you go down a little bit, we can... His name is Happy, like the god of the flooding Nile. Yeah, upwards. Okay. Yeah. Could, and, and, and zoom in in this part? The monument, and this is possibly why it was saved, is hard to get to. When you're at the quarry, it's not very comfortable and the light is poor. But on this, it's completely clear. You can see all the details you couldn't see down there. It's a terrific tool. So he's, he's right about being uncomfortable. It's kind of like working under a car because yeah. of the way it was tilted. It's the end of the afternoon. In okay, the that's... Celsius. But now, but now, you know, you, you can sit in the... Uh, go ahead and pause that, Andy. So now you can go ahead and you can sit in your, your office chair and just look at it to your heart's content. Yeah, and I, I actually put this up as a gigapixel photograph that you can navigate around and explore. Oh, wow. And dive into and see all the resolution that I captured. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did was Philippe came up, because normally when archaeologists go there, what they do is they take acetate and they put it over the hieroglyphics and the pictograph and they trace it out with a, a, you know, with a, a, a black marker they'll um a sharpie or whatever and they'll they'll just trace uh -huh. it and then everyone just kind of has to trust them that that's what was there so what we did in this case was uh we took what he did he, he also did that because we wanted a comparison of techniques and then i took that and i i took all i scanned all of that and i superimposed it over the original photographs so that anyone any other egyptologist that wants to could, because some of those are highly eroded so there's a little bit of guesswork Going, right. going into trying to figure out what the hieroglyphic says so that you can kind of A, B back and forth between his interpretation and the real image. So potentially if someone else at some later date thought that maybe it said something else, you know, they could make an argument uh, that it did based on real data. And that's something that Philippe welcomed. You know, it's, he was like, you know, this is, this is a fair-minded activity. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to be able to explore that. That's super cool. So yeah. uh, what does someone need like in terms of technology to 
get into this. I mean, you, you talked about a, you need a VR helmet to, you know, mm-hmm. view it, right? Yeah. And there's some software on the back end. But mm-hmm. if there's an adventurer that's going out there into the field, like what kind of camera do you... Like I noticed you had... You, you were tracking the camera around. Like, yeah. is there any sort of special equipment besides? I, I'm sure all of our guys have, you know, the latest, greatest. Yeah, these are high cameras. resolution DSLRs, and I should have brought an, one of these little cameras I discovered recently with me. On our last, uh, maybe two two weeks ago, that we had, there was a uh, the the social chat before this event, uh-huh. and I, I I was showing some of the cameras that I've used. But I discovered one called the KuCam Q O O which captures panoramas, panoramic video at mm-hmm. 8K, 600 oh, wow. bucks, something like that. I mean, if you're going out on an adventure, like slide that in your pocket. It's tiny. For sure, yeah. Tiny little camera, inexpensive, 8K, spherical. Like you could do a lot with something like that. Otherwise, this is just, a, you know, a good DSLR. But that's all you need, just a d- DSLR, and then you have to know the technique of, of what to shoot. The technique, and then the time you spend in software afterward. I mean, sure. not everyone's up for but, I mean, doing that. But the way you did anyone, it, you didn't know, th- this technology didn't exist when you took some of these pictures. Yeah, it kind of partially existed. Yeah. It was kind of just about ready. But I noticed in one of them, you know, you, you showed the position of the camera. So is that calculated um, in the photogrammetry Yeah. So. later? Uh, yeah, because you saw the camera moving mm-hmm. around, and it showed the position of the camera. Is that captured? You know, on the site thing or? is that with photogrammetry, any anyone can kind of do something, and and you may you'll you will get a result. You take a whole bunch of pictures of the same thing and just move the camera, taking pictures of the same thing, you're yeah. going to get a result. Whether it's the result you intended, that that may or may may not come out, and you learn over time how to do it right. Uh, uh, from experience. So it is certainly anyone can try to start doing and you'll get a result. And over time, you'll be able to control that result more and more. But basically, if someone was out there and they said, this place needs to be in VR and they've got a nice camera, they can just take a ton of pictures. Take a ton of pictures moving the camera between every photograph. So you never take more than one picture from the same spot. So different it's, physical locations in space yeah, of the whole mostly area. looking at the same thing. Like every photograph is like 90% the same. So you're just slowly enlarging the area with every photograph. Yeah. Come talk to me if any <laughs> any any of you adventurers have want to do something. Well, you know, we've got a lot of adventurers and they've got good cameras. Yeah. You know? Oh, I, and and you know, I'm know sure that. I'm sure that might be a thing that that yeah might get popular pretty pretty soon here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. So before before did is there anything else you wanted to talk about before we take some questions from the chat here? Mm. Oh, I wanted to talk about climbing uh, Mount Sinai. Oh yeah. Okay. So this was a fun trip, and this is this is the mountain. Can you pop that back up, Andy? This is. I, I oh mean, yeah. This is, this is this from is from the topography. balloon flight. So oh. this is the photogrammetry that I did from the balloon flight over Hatshepsut's tomb. And this is kind of a preliminary thing. So this is what it looks like when you're in the software uh, creating it. But this I did from, you know. So this topography was created from the photos yeah, that you from took like from the balloon. from like a dozen balloon. photographs from a hot air balloon. A dozen? You did this yeah. with 12 pictures? Yeah. Holy crap. So this is not that many, just a few. Um, so when I was there, I, I, this was the main thing. I'm like, I want, I need aerials. Uh, aerials are super useful. But in Egypt, oh my gosh, it's so hard to get aerials. It's, you know, you can't... It, airspace, so you can't flow a dra- flow airspace a is only military. They only... Right. All airspace is military airspace there. Um, so Because of the Israelis, probably, huh? Not to get political about Israel, but... <laughs> yeah, not... Yeah, or Egypt, but uh, it... Yeah, so we had this... I have some other pictures of us. So the way we did our aerials for that project was all kite aerial photography. So this, oh, the, the other photographer, Mark Eagle, had specialized in a bunch of that, brought out rigs for kite aerial photography. So it's just a really special kite that's flying a really expensive camera. It's, it's a, a kind of normal kite. It's just one that's mostly stable. And then uh, you use a, something called a pic VA, which is a series of strings and pulleys to hold the camera so it's always pointing down. And then we flew it and kind of got the best thing we could because 
first thing they tried to do is they hired the Egyptian military, but it was all Soviet era helicopters and the vibration was so bad. And back in those days, all the, uh, they didn't have any of the active stabilization. It was all just like the spinning weights to stabilize your camera. Uh -huh. And even with the stabilizers, they couldn't get any useful photography from it because the whole thing is just rattling, you know, all the hell. Um, so no useful photographs from that. Then we tried to get, you know, ability to do a private flight. We couldn't do that. Then we tried, we applied to get drone permission. We couldn't, they never gave us permission to do that. And we applied to get it So like, we want to fly kite. And they even denied that for a long time. So uh, we eventually got permission to fly a kite and that was hard. So we flew the kite uh, with a pic VA and we got a bunch of material and that's in, in those somewhere is a bunch of stuff on that. But that was, that was Mark Ecole flying it, and then I did the post-processing. on. Oh, this is heading out. Oh, here we go. This is out to Mount Sinai. So this is 60-mile-an-hour photography. Um, uh, is this Mount the, Sinai going up on the left? Uh, it's not. This is on the, like, four-hour taxi drive, ride to Mount Sinai uh, from uh, Sharm el -Sheikh. How long of a hike is it up to the top? Um, it was most of the night, so... Uh, yeah, and just tab through these while I talk, I guess. Uh, so basically, someone on our, our trip was from Egypt, and she's like, oh, she's like, if you're going to Shoma Sheikh, you should go up and cl go climb Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of that. And by coincidence, someone was going to hire me to do a model from, 3D model from Mount Sinai. So it's like, uh -huh. oh, this is perfect. Um, and I got in touch with the monk that was in charge. It's like one of the oldest monasteries in the world, 17 centuries old. It's the end of the um, after. Yeah, let's skip that one. So, and this is at the top for Don. So, so this is the top of Mount Sinai? Yeah. This so, image that we have coming up here? Yeah. So wow. uh, what, what she told me, she's like, wow, you know, um, there's this wonderful thing that happens because there's this, this uh, Orthodox monastery at the base of the mountain that was established by... Um, uh, 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 Catherine, who, who uh, um, was the uh, mother of, uh, I'm thinking Byzantium, um, not thinking the right historical name at the moment, uh, the, the guy who, who brought Rome over to Christianity. Um, Constantine. Constantine. Yeah. So it's Constantine's mother established this monastery. Okay. Um, so it's one of the oldest it's supposedly they have the burning bush there and all, all of this type of stuff. Um, but she was like, you know, it's really wonderful. You go there and they have like little dormitories you can stay in, in the monastery. And then you get up at midnight and then you climb to the top of uh, uh, Mount Sinai and you can watch the sunrise. And she said, it's wonderful. There's like maybe a dozen people. They're all carrying candles. They're singing, you know, Greek or Orthodox hymns going all the way up. She's like, it's really relaxing and beautiful and wonderful and you have to experience it if you're in the area. Hmm. So I was like, wow, this sounds awesome. So a couple of my friends from the production and I, we go down to Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, we make the side trip up to uh, St. Catherine's Monastery. Um, then we, uh, we go in, we pay our, you know, it was super cheap. It was like less than $30 to like, stay the night and get food and all this stuff. And then we met some Russians, that Russian pilgrims that were staying there that were heavy absinthe drinkers. And so we stayed up <laughs> drinking absinthe with them and then slept for half an hour and then got up to go climb Mount Sinai. So we exit. Still the, drunk on absinthe. Yeah. It's drunk on absinthe. We're, we're leaving the monastery and... Then they, you know, the, the monks tell us, like, you're required to hire a bodyguard, an armed bodyguard. Like, you, you cannot walk this route without an arm, armed guard, which we had a, a bunch of that in Egypt. Um, so we go there. I'm like, well, who do we hire? And they're like, well, just walk out there and someone will approach you and you hire. Sounds like is. a racket to me. <laughs> oh, we're like, okay. So we, well, we ran into this before too, because when we traveled in this area, we, you, you always had to have armed guards. Uh, so we go out, and it's like the only person who comes up to us is this like kid who's, 
I don't know, 14, 15 years old, something like that. And he's wearing like, uh, you know, he's got an elastic waistband and he's got a huge Glock in his elastic waistband that's like pulling his pants down. His pants are falling down because of the Glock <laughs> in his pants. And so he, he provides security for us. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, so this is our security guard. And then we step out onto the path thinking like we're expecting this like, oh, it's going to be a dozen people, super peaceful. I don't know if we came on a holiday or everything had changed since uh, the person who advised that we try this, do this. But there had been about like, you know, 25 Greyhound buses full of people. Whoa. That I was like, what, like 50? No. Showed like up. Hundreds. And there, there was like a trail. You could see the candles. It was really beautiful at first. Like all these tr- candles going up. Like, oh, that's awesome. It'd become this big tourist thing for pilgrims. Uh-huh. for Orthodox pilgrims. And so half of them are like so out of shape, there's no way they can make the climb. So they're all on camels and donkeys. And so like the whole way climbing up, you know, eye level uh, with a donkey when you're following a donkey is... You're not at eye level, you're at butthole level. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it's it's a rotten, rotten place to be. Um, and... It was just the whole trail was jammed. We're getting jostled and like we're all crammed in with all these people and going up this trail. So it's about 2,500 feet from the um, uh, uh, from where it started to the peak. And it took most most of the night. And so we were hiking up this and we're just, you know, it, it was kind of uncomfortable being on the trail because you can't see much. <laughs> and you're and, like drunk. Heading towards hungover, right? Yeah, trying to avoid the nastiness coming out of the camel in front of you. Right. And getting like bumped off the trail by pack animals carrying fat tourists, you know. And so we're going up this, and it's just like this cramped thing. And then at some point, like, you know, the pack animals are like loosing rocks and boulders and all kinds of stuff. And at one point, I hear up ahead of us, I hear what sounds like a very large boulder rolling. Yeah. Like down the, the trail. And I hear cries of people who I assume are getting hit by this thing. <laughs> and it didn't, I never see it, but I heard it. And then there's a lot of commotion. We kind of walk by and there's all these people gather around we just kept on going Did someone get like i mean a bunch of ankles got jacked up or is there I, like I, someone you know infirm or dead on the side of the trail i don't think it was anyone dead and uh, i there was not much i could do in the situation in egypt and not speaking the language and all the other complications there wasn't much i could do there but there yeah. was someone people were getting hurt <laughs> So this was not the serene experience. No, this that was you not the it. serene experience. This was like this. But you got to the top, yeah. right? What was the top like? So this is a th- so yeah. We we kind of go th- we go picture. through this horrible like you know experience going up. But when we got up there pre dawn, it was magical. It was this amazing landscape of just these desert mountains and all the layers of desert out in front of you and watching the sunrise. And um, there was kind of a little, uh, now the first, I wanted to get a panorama of all of this, which we've got, that's the one up right there. This is a panorama? Yeah, there may be more than one copy of that if you just get through. How long did that take? Because every, every time you turn around, there's a camel, right? Yeah, so that took a few oh, minutes. I don't think that's anything. But um, uh, anyway, so we, we, we went through and we, uh, uh, I had to, uh, okay, so the problem was that it was too crowded all the people everywhere to shoot a panorama. So I had to uh, jump out to this little spire, um, which was a little scary. I mean, not that far, probably four or five feet out to this spire, but it was enough to right. you know, get your juices flowing, uh, uh, getting out to it. But it was perfect, because then I was far enough away from everybody that I got a good... I think this uh, is like, I mean, every adventure here probably has uh, experienced yeah. this, right? You're like, I just want to take a 
picture the damn landscape of all these <laughs> freaking people would all get out of the tourists, way. All, right? these damn all, tourists. These, all these people like ruining my shot. <laughs> <laughs> all these people had the same idea I did. <laughs> You know, at some point you think you're like, oh, you know, I guess I'm not an anthropologist because. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, it's true, it's true. But you know, it it was it was worth every step going up that, and it was yeah. a fantastic experience. I would highly recommend it to people, even given the the crowds. But maybe the, find a non crowded day to do it. The, yeah, try not to do it on a you know a, a Orthodox holiday. Uh, That's probably what it was. <laughs> yeah, and that, that that might be difficult. I'm not sure. I don't know. But um, uh, anyway, so but you can do the hike any time of year, right? Because it's Egypt, and you're hiking yeah. in the middle of the night. So. Oh yeah, yeah. No, and and all the monks were really wonderful and and nice, and it it was awesome checking out the the monastery. Um, I loved it. I thought it was great. It was a fantastic experience, and being on the top there right at sunrise was just magical. Yeah, um, that was something else, and the hike down was beautiful, just awesome hike down. So there, there was a lot there uh, to see. So we did that, and then we went back to Sharm El Sheikh and did some diving. Um, I saw that picture of you underwater. Yeah. So there's. Yeah. You know, so what is it like diving in? You said the Red Sea. Yeah, yeah. It's diving in the Red Sea, and it was. I mean, find uh, any chari- Egyptian chariots down there? No, no, no more artifacts. Then it was just wildlife and having a good time, and um, you know, just seeing something new and exciting. And uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert where I know all the animals that I saw, but uh, you know, incredible uh, opportunities to photograph beautiful fish and uh, just uh, the visibility, the temperature. Yeah. Everything was wonderful. So that, that was another kind of got to wrap up the trip with a with a with a great experience. Yeah. Might as well scuba dive, hey. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Let's take some questions from the chat. Oh yeah. Um yeah. we we, we, we have, should. We've been going on a long you know, time. Yeah, not too long. Pretty good, pretty healthy. Okay. Um Andy, do we have some questions in the chat? Yes, sir, we do. Happy New Year, everyone. Great to see you all in the chat for the first show of the year. Uh, first question comes from Sinclair. Sinclair wants to know, what Microsoft software did Greg use? Yeah, so it's a discontinued uh, piece of software that was called Photosynth. Um, it was the, uh, so what was special about photogrammetry it had been around for a while, but it was very manual. This was the first one that kind of automated it, but it was only used for photo collections, not for, um, not for doing photogrammetry. And, uh, but it was under the hood, it was really doing all this amazing stuff. Um, so that was, so it was like Microsoft's like photo album. App, yeah. But, but it was like this Ferrari under the hood of, of photogrammetry. Yeah. Yeah. Like they were trying to do something really simple with this amazing technology. Uh, and they weren't really, because they, what they wanted, what they wanted is they wanted to create something they wanted you know, there's no like, there's not a lot of interest for a company that big to make a tool that's super specialized that only a small segment of people can use, even if they sell it for a lot of money. Yeah. What they want to do is they want to create the next iPhone. They want they want something that everybody needs and everybody uses. So this was an attempt to make take the technology that did this, you know, amazing Ferrari stuff, but yeah. use it to power something that anyone would use that your mother would use you know for her photo collections Greg, or whatever. don't you think they should just be happy with windows like everybody uses windows isn't that enough yeah well they wanted another windows they're like we want we want another isn't thing it that enough that like 90 percent of the computers run their operating system they've got to yeah. have anyway it, 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 but what was that you had a new app on, on, on a newer app that you did the photogrammetry from the balloon oh yeah, what yeah. Was that? so now now i use uh, something called capturing reality Pretty frequently, um, there's capturing an, reality is the software title. Yeah, they're really confusing in their messaging because it's like the name of the company is Reality Capture, and their tool is capturing reality. But like Adobe, or maybe it's the other way around. Does Adobe not have some sort of tool nope. that does this? No, nope. there's another piece called uh, Agisoft um, that's pretty good. I what does the software cost? Is it like thousand bucks for a, a seat for a year? Or yeah, so. Um, no, it's not that expensive. So uh, Agisoft is a good tool, and that's about two hundred bucks for the standard version, thirty five hundred for the advanced version. 
Um, Add your soft. Yep. And then uh, Capturing Reality, which has probably got the biggest market share now. Uh, that one, they have a bunch of different confusing licenses and mostly, I won't say that everyone hates it, but you know, there, there, there's a lot of, some people love it, some people hate it. But they, they, chart, they have one model where they charge by the pixel. <laughs> so, okay. But, yeah, I, I, but the, the essence of the question is what would you use now to do this? I use reality capture for reality capture. Uh, 80% of the time I'm using that. And that they have, they have a version you can buy. They, they, have like, they have a whole bunch of levels that you can enter. You can just pay for the photographs that you're using. So maybe you're paying 30 bucks to do a project. Or you can buy the software for $3,500. Or you can buy like the whole unlimited software for fifteen thousand dollars, and then you can create VR worlds. Or do you have to have another program after that to put it under your VR yeah. headset? So you can create the models and all of that, and then you create the VR experience using a game engine. Okay. So uh, I've been using mostly Unity. Mm -hmm. There's another one called Unreal. They're both awesome. Um, so you have to use a game engine to get it into VR. That's how you design the interactivity. Um, put the water in, stuff like that. Yeah, put the water in. Uh, I'll give you the ability to pick things up, uh, uh, create interfaces, and create more advanced experiences. Like this one was, this one was really simple. This is just like, you're there. You know what would be a really cool thing to add for the, if, if you could give someone a stone tool and they could deface <laughs> the monument just to yeah. get it out of their system. Well, it's you like can here, practice. Here, have, have, a, have, have, a steel, have a steel thing and carve your name in this monument. Yeah. Well, do the, it in VR so we don't have to see it in real life. Well, right? well even, even for people doing research and stuff, like they want to mark up, they want to put notes, attach notes, yeah. and then share those with other people. Uh, another thing you can do, which I've done a little bit of, is multi-user environments. So you can be in there with someone else who's maybe on the other side of the country. Hmm. So if you're studying, it, you know, if, if you look into the experts in the Mogao Caves, they're spread all over the world, and there's, there's a very few of them. So, so you can say, look at this, and you can point to it. You can go in there with the six, six of the world's experts that are, you know, one's in Belgium, one's, you know, uh, one's in China, one's in the United States, and you can all be in there together at the same time for as long as you want, and you can highlight things and you can mark them up and chain and basically attach your notes and your findings and share them with people. That's amazing. So <laughs> that's that's this is what you can do. And this is with simple tools like game engines. Yeah. And they're you know, they used to be really hard to use and hard to learn, but they're a lot simpler now. Hmm. That's super cool. All right, next question, Andy. Next question is what uh can the general public access your VR work from home? Uh, yeah, actually, anyone who wants, anyone watching this, just contact me, I'll, I'll set you up with some stuff. But um, there are a number of pieces. I did a bunch of work with uh, the Icelandic singer Bjork. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's got a, a VR album called Volcanera that uh, you can download that, you can experience that. Um, Otherwise, I'd, I'd say mostly, and I've got some stuff on some different platforms, but actually I, didn't, I should have written all this down before it came. We can write it down in the description of this video. Oh, there you yeah. go. There you go. I we got gotcha. you. Um, but uh, when the club opens up again, I'll just bring stuff in. And, and if you want to go to the Amazon or you want to go to China or you want to go to this spot in Egypt, yeah. That's that's amazing. You can experience <laughs> it here. All right, next question, please. Next question comes from Genie FS. What are the age of the tombs? That's a really good question. I'm not prepared to answer, but I think it's uh, uh, it's I think that those tombs were um, before the Greeks, uh, before the Potomac um, eras. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they were, they were earlier than that. It was, it was when, before Egypt, uh, got conquered by Alexander the Great. So, right. When the aliens were still in charge. Right. Right. When they were still in communication with the aliens. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question, please. 
Next question is, uh, what is the name of the documentary and where can we find it? Yeah, this was really frustrating. So I worked on this a uh, long time ago and it was so exciting and it aired on television. I was, I was stoked on it. And then I, I pitched this talk and then I started looking for it. <laughs> It's I'd not even on like Hulu or Quibi I, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, I lost Where's my Quibi? copy, and I was just like, "Oh no, I need, I need a way. I need to review all this stuff because it's been a long time." And um, I could not find it anywhere. The only place I could find it was something called Click View, out of Australia, and they still have it. And they have a free two week. Um, they require you to talk to one of their salespeople. It was on TV though. It was on National Geographic Television. Oh, wow. It was on French Channel 3. Um, so like the French Netflix? Uh, Netflix? Maybe. Maybe if you speak French, you can probably, you know, you might be able to find it. But on uh, the uh, Roots and Wings. Uh, Roots and Wings is the... Well, it says Racine and... That's uh, the French name. Know. Yeah. And, and the well, that's not the French name of this show. It's the name of the... The series. The series. Okay, and um, this was a this was an individual episode of this series. Yes. So Roots and Wings was the s the series, mm -hmm. and the episode was it was like arts and culture. Uh, the episode, uh, I'm not going to remember the French, but it was uh, basically the secret secret of the Pharaoh's builders. Secret of the Pharaoh's builders. Yeah. All right, we'll see if we can find it and post it in the I'll, description. I'll just post it in this description. Yeah. I, I've all right, got, next I've question, please. Next question is from Larry Stern. Thank you so much for tuning in, Larry. Uh, are the thousands of people loading the monuments employees or slaves? That's a good question. Um, so, uh, you know, it's kind of the traditional uh, explanations are that all these people were slaves. Um, but in talking to Philippe about this, uh, that is not the current thinking. Um, the current thinking is that this was uh, religious and national devotion uh, that people exercised and that most of the work was done, or much of the work was done uh, when the crops were flooded um, and basically everyone was not working uh, because when, when the crops were flooded. Um, there was work done all year round, but um, there was more labor available when the crops are flooded. Um, and it's believed that they were not slaves, that they were, they were, and there's also um, at uh, Hatshepsut's tomb there, there's uh, lots of illustrations of people getting paid in beer. Um, so, Makes sense. Yeah, I, I, you know. That's how all the work gets done around the Adventurers Club. That's right. <laughs> the little, little, little whiskey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's, it is believed that they were not slaves. Okay. Current thinking, though. Still debatable, but, you know. Yeah. Well, they have records of them getting, of people getting paid. There you go. So that's, that's uh, like, maybe there were some slaves, too. But we, paid, we pay people to stamp license plates in prison, but, you know. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, so. the society is so removed from what we have today. Yeah, I, I can't state it with any authority yeah. myself, but my understanding of the current thinking is that they were not slaves. All right, next question, please. Final, Final question. Final question night. from the chat. Uh, comes from Larry Stern again. Thank you so much for your questions, guys. Uh, how did you get into this type of photography? Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story in itself. But uh, uh, so when I was in high school, I, I took a darkroom film photography class and I got really interested in something called liquid light which was liquid emulsion that you could pour onto any object you wanted so I started by printing on cow skulls and then I, I learned about plaster casting so then I was trying to print images of people's faces onto plaster casts of their faces um, so I started trying to marry two-dimensional work and three-dimensional work then. And then I went to college and I didn't think about that stuff for, you know, a short six years it took me to finish college. And then after college I got into photography again and um, 
I started uh, working at Apple, and they brought the first panoramic stitching photography uh, uh, tools, have made those available. So I switched to digital way too early. Most of the stuff I shot there is like 640 by 480 images. It's sad. You're like, look at the resolution on this. <laughs> that was a big mistake. But I switched too early. But um, I did learn a lot from it. Uh, so I started stitching spherical images, panoramas, and I got immersed in that for a while. And then um, a researcher who's now, now a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Debevic, but at the time I didn't really know him, in 1996, he uh, created a paper on uh, photogrammetry. And I saw that and I was like, oh my God, this is like something vibrated in my head. And I was like, I have to do this. And I figured out ways to do that before there were sufficient like tools that were designed to do that. So I was trying to make other tools do that. And so I started doing that. And then I worked for the first company to make photogrammetry software. And so I worked for them in France. And then I went from that to visual effects and then kind of went back and forth between being a photographer, visual effects and movies, you know, kind of going back and forth, documentaries, cultural heritage work. So I kind of went back and forth between entertainment, cultural heritage, and so VR hit. And then when VR hit, I was like, this is what I want to do. So anyways. That's, that's pretty the, cool. That's the, that's the shortest, I think, way I can tell that story. Well, hey, Greg, thank you for coming by. This was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Greg Downing, member, member 1221. One of our brand new members, you're going to have to come by when the club reopens, whenever, <laughs> to, uh, to check out some of his VR work, and, and hopefully we'll get that out to some members. Maybe if, I don't know if anybody has VR set, sets out there. Yeah, but, let me know if you have a VR headset. Um, um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you for coming by. We really appreciate your time. Awesome. <laughs>